Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to Market Watchers Live with Aaron Swinlin and Tom Bowley. I'm your host, Tom Bowley. Today's show is being recorded, so you should be able to play back any or all of Market Watchers Live at your leisure. If you're unable to attend the show live, you can now go to www.stockcharts.com slash webinars. Follow the link to Market Watchers Live and play back the show. Each show will be archived on our site until the next show begins, so roughly for 24 hours. If you'd like to review an older program, you can now find those at our YouTube channel or on Facebook. During today's show, please feel free to submit your ticker symbol request, questions and comments using the chat window next to the video player. Later in today's show, Aaron will provide me stock symbols from your questions, and I'll use those requests in the 10 in 10 segment at 1250 Eastern Standard Time, where I'll attempt to annotate 10 stocks in 10 minutes. Market Watchers Live now airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays, from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you'd like to be part of the show, you can reach us via our chat room or Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at Market Watchers Live. That's at MKT Watchers Live. As you leave today's show, uh, we'd love to get your feedback. The bottom right-hand por portion of your screen, you'll see a How'd We Do section, and there will be a link to a very brief one-question survey. We'd love to know what you thought of today's show and, uh, of course, any suggestions you have for future shows. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. We are certainly glad to have you. And for our regulars, welcome back to this Friday edition of Market Watchers Live. A couple of quick announcements uh, here in just about maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Aaron Swinland will uh, discuss chart patterns and some of the things that you need to be aware of um, as you check out your charts. Um, so that will uh, probably go on, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, maybe a little longer. We'll be looking for your questions. Uh, so there will be a, a brief question and answer period following. Um, we'd love to get questions from you. Uh, also, next Wednesday, uh, I will not be in, but uh, Mark Young um, from Wall Street Sentiment will be joining Aaron on the show. So I'm sure there'll be a lively discussion about sentiment. Uh, so you want to make sure you tune in next Wednesday. Also, just want to make a quick announcement that Market Watchers Live uh, obviously will not be here for the show next Thursday as it's Thanksgiving Day and the markets are closed. Uh, but we also won't be here on Friday either. It is an abbreviated session on Friday. The U.S. stock market closes at 1 p.m. Eastern. And uh, so we'll be back uh, from the holidays that following Monday. And I know you, we got a big day lined up here, Aaron, but how are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. We actually got a little bit of rain this morning, and that's really a dusting. It wasn't enough to make even a puddle, but... The mountains are looking a lot better. The The dust and ash really needed a bit of wetness to keep it from flying around. So it was a surprise sitting on my patio this morning and getting some raindrops on my head. I was like, what's that stuff? <laughs> well, all the fires are out now, right? I mean, no more fires? Yeah, it's, I know it's Southern California for sure. And I believe in Northern California, they finally got it under control. But I don't think they've even assessed all the damage yet. So, Okay, well. We didn't have it as bad down here. But yeah, it was scary for me because it seriously was right on the hill across from my house. But um, it wasn't that bad for a lot of people down here. So, well, cool. I know we got it. Uh, you know, we've had pretty. Uh, I don't know exactly what the word is. I'd call it this week, but we've had a lot of up and down, a lot of uh, gap downs, and then followed by uh, some attempt at a recovery. And then yesterday we actually had a nice gap up and continued buying throughout the session. And then today, especially on the Dow and S&P, we saw some weakness earlier. And I know just recently we we're at the lows of the day. So uh, got a lot to talk about today. So I'm going to turn it over to you and you can go through the agenda for today and then give us that first market update. All right. It's chock full of very interesting information. I'll be giving uh, market updates on the half hour. We're going to start with uh, Tom doing some talking technically, letting you know what economic reports or any other interesting uh news out there, financial news. I'm going to go ahead and do uh, the chart pattern workshop. So uh, you'll want to stick around for that, of course. And we will be recording that. So we should have it uh, available later on. But you can always come back here to the archive and watch this show again if you want to take notes. I'll also do it in the recap. So I'm planning on making a very large recap for market watchers today with lots of chart patterns in it. So you'll want to check that out. 10 and 10 to 1, we're going to start with GUSH, G-U-S-H, and that'll be the first one for the 10 and 10 to 1. We'll take a look at that. 
sentiment update. I'm going to give you a brief sentiment update, let you know where we're at. I think the charts are really interesting right now. So uh, even though I'm going to do a lot of talking in the first part of the program, I definitely want to go over some of those sentiment charts. But then after that, uh, we'll look at an anatomy of a trade by Tom. So he'll uh, be telling you uh, how he actually did a trade and, you know, set stops and et cetera, et cetera. And then we'll follow it up uh, if we have time with uh, some questions and a wrap up. And before we get started, though, I did want to show everybody we did a what would you do segment yesterday. And I wanted to show everybody what the Twitter sphere thought. And we looked at XBI, the biotech spider, and uh, Tom and I had slightly different positions. I said to leave it alone. Tom was saying that it was a pretty good buy and hold buy or hold right now. So that seems to be where the uh, sentiment is right now is in the buy and hold arena. And nobody was really interested in selling or shorting it. So you may want to go take a look at XBI and see what you think. And with that, I'm going to get started with our first market update. All righty, I better get to the right screen so you can see what I'm talking about. All right, here's our candle glance. I'm going to go ahead and uh, refresh it to where it is now. But as we can see, it seems like we're back to where we were, gap down and then consolidation or an attempt at uh, bringing the losses uh, to a point where they're not so bad. Uh, but we can see with the S&P, we got the gap down and now we're pretty much consolidating sideways. NASDAQ's mostly unchanged down only uh, slightly. We can see Russell 2000, you know, it's it didn't gap down. And it moved mostly straight across, and it is now in positive territory, and it set a new intraday high, and a high greater than yesterday. So looks like uh, the 600 and the small caps are starting to come back to life, and that could mean good things for our large cap indexes as well. We can see that uh, Treasury yields uh, started up, but they are now down. Reading right now at 23.38, UUP gap down, an attempt to bring back uh, and take back some of those losses, but it price just fell for UUP further down. And we can see it is now uh, making int new intraday lows. And uh, commodities up, but you can see that with oil, we got that gap up and now we're starting to move uh, further higher. And it looks like we're getting a little consolidation here. So we might be forming a bit of a flag. We'll have to see how that resolves. Uh, gold gapped up and is continuing higher. Uh, not a surprise, you know, we've been getting this consolidation in the market and this is an area where, where you usually find the safe haven as an investor. So a lot of people move to metals when uh, they start feeling bearish. So this is interesting information just in and of itself. The VIX is lower. We're getting readings right now at about 1135. Uh, yesterday, as you can see, though, we, we definitely got above 12 on the VIX. And that's uh, interesting. People are starting to feel more bearish, even on a day when we were looking at uh, some some price rises going on. Uh, we can see that uh, declines are leading advances at this time. I'm going to bring you to the market page. We're going to look very quickly at the market summary. And here we go. I'm going to arrange it, filter it, uh, sort it by percent change. And as far as the major indexes, look what's on top, our small caps, uh, the 600 and 2000, so uh, Russell 2000. So they are making the moves, but uh, transports and utilities are getting hit rather hard right now. As far as our sector spiders, energy and consumer discretionary are leading, and we can see that utilities and consumer staples are currently at the bottom as laggards. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to you, Tom, and that concludes our first market update. All right. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting day for sure out there. Um, got a few things to talk about. First, um, before I get into some of the charts, just to bring you up to date on some of the economic news out this morning, really wasn't much. We've had a pretty busy week, but today it was all about housing. The October housing starts came out 1,290,000 units. The market was expecting 1,190,000 units, so we had a beat there. And then October building permits, expectations were for one uh, 1.25 million units, and we actually came in at almost 1.3 million units. So both housing starts and building permits came in stronger than expected. So I figure the first place to start is to take a look at the uh, uh, home construction index. 
And you can see we're actually breaking to new highs. I was a little concerned about this index going into today for a couple of reasons. Number one, very overbought. You can see that this group has been just absolutely on fire for about the last eight weeks. And so a lot of good news is built in. And we had good news earlier this week. I think it was the house, um, maybe the house price index. I'm not sure what uh, report had come out earlier. Um, but I know there was good news earlier this week. And you can see that we just kind of went flat with the uh, home construction index. So you had to wonder whether all the good news was already built in with this huge rally that we've seen. And then we had the great housing starts and building permits number today. And I figured, okay, if we go down today with that kind of news, then perhaps we've just topped out in the near term uh, in the home construction area. But that is not the case. Right now we're actually putting in another fresh new high on home construction. So that uh, certainly is worth keeping an eye on. Uh, also overnight, or actually this morning, um, the DAX, the German DAX. Now this doesn't show today's action. Actually, I think the last time I looked, the DAX was down about 50 or 60 points. But a couple things of note, um, there's a strong positive correlation between the DAX and the S&P 500, as strong if not stronger than any other uh, major index around the globe. And so one of the things that I'm kind of watching and that I was really excited about was seeing this reversal in the DAX back on Wednesday. We went down to the 50 day. It was the first time we had tested the 50 day since breaking above it here in the second week of September. Um, really, we hadn't been anywhere near it. And also, in addition to testing, successfully testing that 50 day, there was also some price support here that we were able to hold with this hammer that printed. So early weakness followed up by a lot of buying. And then yesterday, we had a really strong day. Now, this does not show today's action. But one of the things you can do is simply pull up the ETF, the EWG, to get a sense of what's going on in Germany. You can see today, right now, it's down about half of 1%. So if we look back at the index, that would be roughly about 65 points. And I think uh, last time I looked, it was 50 or 60. So that kind of makes sense. But we're still holding on. I think if we go back down and close below 12.9 on the DAX, I would be a little bit more concerned about the short-term um, nature of you know what's taking place here in the market. So that's something to keep an eye on. The 10-year uh, Treasury yield with all the news out this week uh, really hasn't done a whole lot. We saw move higher than we saw a move back down. And right now it looks like we're just consolidating between 240. And 240 has been a pretty big level with the exception of that breakout, that uh, very brief breakout at the end of October. You can see the 240 for about the second half of 2017 has been a very difficult level to get through. I think it would be bullish for equities if we see that yield move through 240. I think it would be bearish for equities if we see the that we lose that uh, yield support back in the middle of October, down around the 227 level. So for now, that's kind of a pretty narrow range that I'm watching on the 10-year Treasury yield, 227 to 240. We'll see which level gives way first. Um, I do want to mention that um, retail stocks are absolutely on fire today. Huge gap up. And you can see this comes on the heels of some pretty strong action. Look at all these hollow candles and look at the volume picking up. I think retail is making a big move. And I've talked a lot recently about the fact that I, I like the cons um, consumer discretionary area after making this triple top breakout. We actually have been doing that or we did that without much help from retail. And now we've got retail going and you can see even though the S&P hasn't broken out uh, in recent sessions, the XLY is on fire breaking out. So I think this is a pretty strong group. And the reason for the retailers moving up, well, raw stores and I think shoe carnival, maybe even Gap, I think not only beat top and bottom line estimates, but they also raised guidance. Um, you can see raw stores here up over 9% today. I'll go through these retailers. This is the time of the quarter when we do get a lot of retail stocks. Uh, here you've got Gap uh, gapping up, trying to take out resistance uh, at about 29 and a half. Did it intraday and failed at this point. So if we finish strong, I would look for continuing movement to the upside and Gap. But if we don't, then perhaps we'll go back down and fill the gap. But uh, look at the volume coming in here over the past couple of days in gap. So a lot of uh, a lot of accumulation seems to be taking place. And a couple of others real quick, Foot Locker, FL. You can see the gap here. Uh, this is one of those crap shoots with earnings. Take a look at the last two earnings reports on Foot Locker. This one dropped about 15%. This one dropped about 25%. But if you had the nerve to hold this time, you would have gained about 25%. So just kind of shows you the risk involved in holding some of these stocks overnight. Shoe Carnival, um, uh, hold on one second. 
Shoe Carnival reported very strong results, raised guidance, and you can see the reaction. Investors love this. Great volume today so far, not only gapping higher, but trying to continue that move to the upside. So I think it's showing uh, quite a bit of demand. Uh, last two I wanted to show you. One is uh, Abercrombie and Fitch. You can see this one had moved up, maybe been in a little bit of a down channel for the past six, seven weeks. Well, this definitely clears that back up to the upside. A huge move up and a break to 2017 highs on Abercrombie. And the last one is Hibbit, H-I-B-B. This is a sporting uh, retailer, and you can see that the long-term downtrend appears to have ended with today's gap, although I don't like that black candle. Maybe it goes a little bit lower, perhaps back down close to the bottom of gap support. But you can kind of see from these charts and that XRT I showed you, it seems like money is starting to rotate into retail. And that is really good news, not just for the market in general, but specifically for the consumer discretionary sector. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Erin and let her get into her chart pattern uh, segment. Excellent. All right. So yes, I am Aaron Swenlin, and I'm going to talk to you about chart patterns. I'm going to give you an idea of the basic chart patterns that are out there and also explain to you not only what they look like, but how they form, the psychology behind it, because I think that also will help you identify them. And we'll also talk about volume because that does help you confirm some of these patterns. So I wanted to start by showing you where I got all of my information. So let's go over here. And uh, Thomas Bulkowski is my hero. Uh, I absolutely adore his uh, written materials. They're easy to read. This particular book is very easy to read. And I'm going to basically uh, come through all of the chart patterns I'm going to discuss, the psychology, all of this is just notes from uh, Thomas Bulkowski's visual guide to chart patterns. So I definitely want to give him credit where credit is due. Additionally, if you're really into chart patterns, uh, kind of like I am, you can get uh, the Encyclopedia of Chart Patterns. And this is like the Bible of chart patterns. It's a huge book. It's a little harder to read, but he's all, uh, actually done some uh, testing on some of the chart patterns and gives you some percentages of when they tend to, uh, how many times they will actually execute the way they're supposed to. So I'd highly recommend both of these books. I think the visual guide to chart patterns is currently out of stock in the Stock Charts bookstore, but of course you can find pretty much everything uh, online at your favorite retailer for books. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna first start with the rectangle pattern. And I don't, we don't talk about this one as a pattern necessarily. We usually talk about it as a consolidation. And it is actually a chart pattern when it stays within a trading channel. And really the, the main thing you should understand about it is uh, the fact that you do need to have the two horizontals. And the reason these form is just like Greg Morris talked about uh, with us on Wednesday, uh, there's memory. People remember when they bought a stock and they remember when they sold a stock. And so what happens is, of course, you get everybody trying to buy in at the lower price and then it'll push it up to that resistance level and everybody will pull back and say, OK, I just got what it, what I would expect as my uh, price that I wanted. And so I'm going to get out. And then that's when uh, you start seeing the selling come back down. But people remember when it was bought when the support level is, and so they jump back in. And so you end up with this rectangular pattern, up, down, up, down. So the what you need to know, of course, is, well, which way will it break? These can be continuation patterns, meaning they can continue the uh, trend that was going on before them, or they can be reversal patterns. So how do we figure out which one is which? Uh, typically, you can do this following volume. and. The thing is, though, with all of these patterns, the volume patterns don't necessarily uh, work all the time. But the idea is, if you're going to get a break downward from one of these rectangles, you look for volume to start receding as you go along. So I would say, as we're watching here, the buying is starting to recede here. Um, but you know, you're getting a bit of a, a volume punch right here right when it gets that breakdown. So the idea is you're gonna see the, the decline in the volume when you're looking at a rectangle that will likely break down. Now, the opposite would be true if you're gonna get a breakout. You should look for volume to start increasing 
in the pattern. And then you know that more than likely you're going to get a continuation of an uptrend. So there are two, remember, reversal and continuation patterns. So this one can be both, which again, that can be kind of confusing with some of these patterns. But again, volume can help you figure things out. So the next one I'm going to go to is an ascending triangle. And I tried to find charts where I could get uh, the, the more recent information, but sometimes that just didn't work out. So this one is uh, back from uh, earlier in 2017. This is the ascending triangle. And it's called ascending because your support line gets an ascending trend here, rising bottoms. And then the, you get a flat top. And so here are some things you need to know about an ascending triangle. First of all, they can be a reversal or a continuation. And the reason I say that is because you will sometimes get the breakdown here when the expectation, of course, is the breakout. Patterns don't always complete the way they are, they are supposed to. So just be, of course, prepared for that. But the idea is when you get an ascending triangle, what's actually happening there, happening there is you get this increasing demand at the lower prices after you've hit this level of resistance. So each time it starts to come down, you end up with buyers at a price slightly higher than the last low. And that's telling you there's some interest here. But when it gets up to that resistance level, it just can't push out until it gets near the end of the pattern and you start seeing that uh, increase in volume a little bit here. So that's when you would look for those breakouts from the ascending triangle. So the majority of the time, the expectation for an ascending triangle is a breakout to the top. Okay, so that is, you can get these in varying time horizons, meaning with a lot of these chart patterns, I'm showing you daily charts, but you can actually apply them. You can actually apply them to shorter range charts. And I think I actually have a 60 minute chart in here for one of the examples. So that is your ascending triangle. So what's uh, the opposite? Well, we have the descending triangle. So let's go to that one. See, I have lots of chart patterns to show you. All right. So here's the descending triangle. And it's pretty much the opposite of what we saw. These are bearish. The expectation is a breakdown from these patterns. But again, they can break either direction. Uh, but typically, you're going to see a breakdown from these patterns. So what you're looking for is a horizontal bottom and a declining tops trend line. And the psychology here is the fact that you've got people who are the buyers come in and, and acquire that stock at that fixed support line. And then you start forming that line of support. And then as stock becomes what they think is overpriced, they'll sell and it'll come back down to this support. It'll start going higher, but it, based on the fact that you're already sort of in this declining trend, it doesn't get up that high. You start forming lower highs. And so you get that declining tops trend line as you're going along. And typically, you're going to be looking at, like I said, for a breakdown from a descending triangle. One thing to keep in mind with all of these chart patterns is you want to avoid uh, what they call excess white space in your triangle patterns. For, for example, I think that's a definite place where you want to not have too much white space. So we have white space would be like this right here. But if we didn't have that uh, test here in the middle and we ended up with this giant area of white space, I wouldn't be looking at, at this as a, as you know, a descending triangle. I mean, you could still, uh, you could still believe that, or you could still use that. Uh, but typically they don't, uh, they're not a good pattern if you have a lot of white space in them. So that's the descending triangle. It is bearish and it can be a reversal or a continuation pattern. So it doesn't matter if you come up into the pattern or whether you come down into the pattern. This, in this case, we have a continuation. If we had come up into the pattern, it would have, of course, been a reversal. So you can have it be a, a continuation pattern where it continues the trend, or it can be a reversal where it comes up into the pattern and then falls. So that is your descending triangle. So now let's look at the other triangle, 
and that would be the symmetrical triangle. And uh, Bolkowski says this is the epitome, how does he put it, the epitome of confusion when you get a symmetrical triangle. So here's a few things to consider about symmetrical triangles. You want to have two sloping trend lines that are getting ready to uh, intersect. You want to look for uh, price crossing from side to side within that triangle, that symmetrical triangle. Again, you want to avoid excessive white space. I think that's a, a bit, a, a lot of white space, but I think because you get that second touch, uh, I, I went ahead and uh, used this as our, as our example. Uh, but again, you do want to avoid as much white space as you can when you're uh, identifying these kinds of patterns. A symmetrical triangle is typically a continuation pattern. Of course, like I said, these patterns can bust and go the wrong way. But typically what you look for when you get a symmetrical triangle is a continuation of the previous trend. So you should expect it to break down. Uh, when you're coming into it from a declining trend and you should expect it to break out if it comes up into the pattern and it'll continue the previous trend. So that is how the symmetrical triangle works. So he, he says it's the epitome of confusion because you've got the bulls pushing price up in the hopes that you know, you're going to get uh, you know, a double bottom or a good chart pattern. You're going to confirm it. Um, but then it doesn't happen and you start getting lower uh, highs. And again, and then you're getting the higher lows. So there's a lot of confusion. Is it going to break out? Is it going to break down? I don't know. I don't know. Is the trend going to continue? I don't know. And so you continue to go this way. One thing to keep in mind with the symmetrical triangle, and I didn't draw it all the way out to the apex, but you don't want it to get all the way down to the apex and then break. It's not really a, a good pattern if you start getting it filling up to the apex. And one of the things I talk about with a lot of the patterns is when you start getting, when they get old like that, um, they're, they're not as uh, reliable. And what you'll get is what I call drift. It'll drift through the pattern. It'll sort of move sideways or it'll move up, but it's gotten so far into the apex that it's going to break out. It has to break out one way or the other. So uh, I don't find them very helpful when you start getting down to that apex because now it's really, is it a, a continuation or are we going to get the, the, the reversal out of it? Uh, it's, hard, it's hard to say because even when you get that breakout, if it gets all the way down to that apex, I don't think it's giving you uh, great information. So that is what your symmetrical triangle is. Now, one thing to keep in mind, because uh, the question often is, uh, well, why isn't this a pennant? Because a pennant is shaped the exact same way. It looks like a symmetrical triangle. Two things. One, it needs to be on a flagpole. And the other is that typically they're going to be under, the pennant itself will be about, it'll be under three weeks. So you want to look for the symmetrical triangle form over more than three weeks. And then you're looking at the symmetrical triangle. And the reason you want to distinguish this is because, because the, the reverse flag or a reverse with the pennant on it is a continuation pattern. It tells you you should expect it to, to move lower. So uh, we want to see this symmetrical triangle because if we come into it, we want to see it uh, break above. And that would be our expectation or break below. The flags are great because that's where you can uh, get these measurements for upside and downside targets. So let's move along and talk about flags and pennants. Hey, Aaron. Yes. Uh, there, there are a couple of questions and a couple I can wait. But um, one question that just recently came in was, um, you know, when you see these patterns, um, what are your like on this one that you just showed on the continuation? What are your price goals? I mean, what are you looking for? After well, like that. Right. And a lot of people, you, you look for those minimum upside and downside targets. Some people uh, will measure the back of the uh, triangle and then they would, that's how they come up with a um, minimum downside target. It would be the size of this uh, the back of the pennant. Uh, so you could expect a, a move down that high or that low. I'm not really, with triangles, I don't usually like to use that measurement uh, formula. It doesn't always work. Well, it doesn't even always work for flags. But uh, I think that 
the main reason is because where it starts is sometimes uh, just dependent on the person who draws the trend lines. And so you may not draw it as far back as somebody else who draws it further back. And now you've got a measurement that's a lot taller uh, than the person who didn't take it back quite as far. So I, I don't usually look for minimum upside downside targets. What you're really looking for when you're talking about triangles is which way is it going to break? Which way should I expect it to go? I hope that helped answer those question, that question. And yes, I'm sure there's plenty in the queue, which is why we'll get to those as soon as I finish. Uh, we're just about there. All right, so let's look at the flag formation. All right, uh, this is the reverse flag. Let me see if I can find a bear flag. I want a bull flag to start. All right, there we go. Okay. All right, so what you're looking for with any flag, of course, first is a flagpole. <laughs> So you want to see a burst, a rally that's almost straight up. Uh, and then, you know, once you get that rally straight up, the, it needs to pause. People think, oh, OK, now I think it's pretty overbought. So uh, you get that uh, a little bit of confusion with sellers, but then buyers want to get in because it's gotten low enough, in their opinion, after this big move. You know, we're always talking about, oh, I want to wait. We got the breakout. Let me wait for it to pull back. Well, that's what happens here. And it goes back and forth, back and forth. And that forms the flag. Now, uh, it doesn't always work. But let me first show you when it does work, how it works. So what you do, you can actually come up with a minimum upside and downside targets with flag formations. Number one, they're continuation patterns. So the expectation for a bull flag is a bullish breakout. For a reverse flag, it's a continuation, and you would start looking for uh, a breakdown. But we're going to talk about the bull flag first. So how do you come up with those minimum upside downside targets? It's With flags, it's pretty simple. You measure the flagpole, and then you add that. If you get the breakout, you add that at the breakout point. And so what I did is I basically copied this, this flagpole annotation and stuck it right on the top. So that is our minimum upside target. Now remember, with targets, they're minimums. That I, I always precede it with minimum upside target or minimum downside target, meaning they can follow through and continue even further. So in this case, as you can see, interestingly enough, we ended up with another flagpole here. And that's about where we ended uh, the, the minimum upside uh, potential didn't happen right off of this first uh, move. But ultimately and eventually we did get uh, a move to that target. You don't always get it to the target right after the breakout, but it gives you an idea of how high you should expect it to go. So one thing to keep in mind also with flags is you don't want uh, the flag part to get too long. Um, for example, <clears throat> excuse me. I would say this flag uh, is getting uh, what I like to call long in the tooth. Uh, you're st it's turning into a declining trend channel. It's getting long enough that it's starting to compete with the flagpole's length. And that's when I feel like the pattern's mostly fallen apart. Now, if you had been watching this on this flagpole and you bought into a really long flag, which again, you could, it's uh, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. The chart pattern is in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, but think about these uh, guidelines. I'm not going to call them rules, but guidelines when you do identify a pattern and what you're looking for. All right. So we got a really long flag here and we got the breakout, but it, uh, it didn't even get up to overhead resistance here. So it didn't break as expected and it ended up going back down. So Again, patterns aren't foolproof, uh, but that's the idea. I don't like to see, in this case, I would have called this the flagpole. And you can see that flag is just about as long as this flagpole. So I wouldn't call it a bull flag. But that's how you can measure the minimum upside downside targets. So let's look at the bear flag, which is the opposite. I know we're getting a, I knew this would take a while. OK, so here is our reverse flag formation. It is a continuation pattern, as I was noting with flags. They are. And again, you can start measuring with these. So you got that nice little flag there. It's, it's long, but not too long. Nice long flagpole. Expectation, breakdown. Got the breakdown. 
where is my minimum downside target? In this case, I, I used our measurement tool. Don't pay too much attention to the numbers in there. I'm just using it for measurement, but that's the length of the flagpole. And when we got the break, uh, the breakdown, that's where you would calculate it's the same size and that's where you get your minimum downside target. And in this case, wow, it came down, found support pretty much right there. Uh, again, patterns don't necessarily work out textbook fashion, but I was able to find a few examples, which was uh, nice, uh, where it did mostly work out. Okay, so that is your bear flag. Let's look now at tops and bottoms, double tops, triple tops, double tops, uh, I'm double bottoms, triple bottoms. All right. So um, these are reversal patterns, meaning they must go into the particular pattern. Uh, let me get you one so it makes sense. Let's see, descending, uh, which double bottom. Here we go. Uh, I actually used the S&P. So I, I found back when we had uh, those uh, deep declines, they really did form pretty much uh, the perfect uh, double bottoms, in my opinion. Uh, so I decided I'd go ahead and use those. So when I say it's a reversal pattern, if we have a bottom, that means we're looking for it to bounce up. So it needs to come down into the pattern or it's not a, re it's not a true pattern, a reversal pattern. It's not a good double bottom. You, you need to find it coming down into that pattern. I think that's pretty critical when you start looking at the double bottom and triple bottom, et cetera. So here are the double bottoms and you can me measure upside targets. Uh, here is the length of the pattern. I just added it to the top of the pattern and uh, that brought us our minimum upside target. And we almost reached it. That was a pretty good execution of that pattern. Then we, we had that move up, but we started back down. We started this declining trend. Of course, we fell very quickly uh, at the beginning of 2016. And all the way down, we formed that first bottom, came back up, developed a support level, came back down, and it was almost even with the previous bottom. And then it comes out the expected, it's a reversal pattern. So we would expect a breakout. And the upside target in this case was right around here. And we did actually get past that uh, minimum upside target. So that is a typical double bottom. I'm gonna show you a triple bottom very quickly. Same idea, only you get three. And again, reversal pattern needs to come down into it if it is a double or triple bottom. And I didn't do the measurement here, uh, but you can use the measurement formula the same way. So we'd be looking at a move pretty much uh, where we got here, really what uh, looks like a flag formation. All right, let's look at the tops. And we're gonna see the double top. These are topping patterns. So what do you need to have? It's a reversal pattern. It needs to come up into the pattern or it's not a true double top. So if we came down and then you know started to move back up like this, the previous trend is down. So it's not a true double bottom. They need to be reversals or double top. Uh, minimum upside, in this case, downside target, length of pattern added to the bottom of the neckline. And there is where you should expect a minimum downside move when you get the breakdown from that particular uh, double top. This one's kind of messy because we did get that bounce off of it, but it's still uh, ultimately formed that it was a second top. So that's why I did use this as an example. You can have very messy double tops, double, uh, triple tops, bottoms. Uh, even uh, Bolkowski talks about that. So you have that textbook formation, but it doesn't have to be perfect as long as it's uh, very close to what we were looking at. Triple top, same deal, only it's got three peaks. There we go. Uh, this one was really, it's, it was great. I'm like flipping through all of these and I saw it and I moved it to a two hour and it just turned out to be the perfect triple top. Again, reversal pattern had to come up into it. Uh, it forms similarly to a rectangle in this case. This turned out to be the neckline. It's where 
it's like the, with the W and you want these two bottoms here, that's your neckline. So the bottoms that are in between the tops. Expected uh, minimum downside target, the length of the pattern, and that would put us right around here. And you can see we did end up below that after the triple top. All right, and now I'm gonna do the wedges. I think those were the only ones I have left. The first one is a bullish pattern. There we are, the descending wedge. Now uh, with the wedge patterns, uh, they tend to be, they tend to be reversal patterns, uh, but they can uh, come out of wherever. Actually, I'm sorry, it's a continuation pattern uh, if you're coming into it. Typically, if you're coming down into it, you're going to end up sort of with a flag formation. But the idea is, you know, price is going, you've got the sellers are are not waiting till it gets up to that previous overhead resistance and starts coming down. It gets below that previous bottom and then the buyers come in and then you start uh, seeing buyers, but they they kind of get scared here. And it and so you're getting these uh, lower highs and uh, lower lows, but you've got these, they, they're not parallel, so it's not a declining trend channel. And uh, we don't look for broadening patterns. I'm, I'm not going to talk about those, but that would mean that you'd get sort of a horn shape. So when you get the wedge, the downside wedge, that's bullish, and you should expect a breakout uh, from them. Again, you could measure targets, but I don't, with wedges and triangles, again, I don't uh, typically use the measurement process, but I think I think it was in Martin Pring's book. I think he talked about doing that. Uh, but I know Bolkowski doesn't use uh, those minimum upside downsides. All right, so now we need the ascending wedge, pretty much the opposite of what we just saw. Uh, again, you have the two, um, the two lines here that are the trend lines that are drawn so that they would eventually intersect, but typically not that soon and it should be pointing upward. And the idea, the textbook uh, tells you to expect a downside uh, breakdown from the ascending wedge. Now we've had a lot of these. I could even pull up the S&P chart, uh, weekly chart, and I think we've got uh, wedges on that pattern and they didn't execute the way that they were supposed to. Uh, price just kept going up. So that's how they would be scrubbed. Uh, you wouldn't, you'd end up, uh, if we kept going up here, now that top, that trend line is uh, broken. Uh, and so the pattern busts and that's how you uh, see them not execute the way you want them to. So that is the basics. Let me make sure I covered them all. I'm pretty sure I did. Yep. I didn't show you a pennant. Let me show you a pennant. All right. And this is on a daily chart. I think you could actually make a case for this being more of a symmetrical triangle. But I just wanted to give you the idea. You're looking for the flagpole. And then you're looking, rather than a, um, a trend channel in a reverse pattern, you'd look for that channel to be moving slightly upward. Uh, you get a symmetrical triangle or a pennant at the bottom of your flagpole. It's the same deal. It's still a continuation pattern. But with pennants, uh, there's... I think more of uh, the possibility of it not uh, following through because it's a symmetrical triangle ultimately. I mean, it's that sort of confusion at the end of this big decline. Uh, so it could it could resolve to the upside. Pennants can re resolve or symmetrical triangles can resolve in either case, but typically continuation patterns, right? So if you come down into it with a flagpole, uh, and then you form that pennant. The expectation, of course, would be the breakdown. But with pennants, they don't necessarily follow through just because they are a pennant. They are like a symmetrical triangle. So that is the conclusion of the basic chart patterns. I will put all of these charts in the Market Watchers Live chart, uh, chart list. They'll be there for a short period of time. So you may want to go and uh, copy them. Uh, and that's pretty much it. I know we only have five minutes uh, before the 10 and 10, uh, but I really wanted to, to give you all a, a good explanation of what these patterns look like and why they typically form. Uh, I'm going to put together a really good PowerPoint and uh, put that all together for you and probably repeat this workshop 
uh, another time and another couple months. So uh, be prepared. And in the meantime, start looking for these patterns. Uh, I'm looking at this one already, and, and you can see that uh, head and shoulders uh, pattern. Ah, that's what I didn't talk about. I knew I missed one. Here's the head and shoulders pattern, left shoulder. I think most of us are very familiar with these. Uh, you can measure and get your uh, targets by the length of the pattern. Uh, you want to typically see volume on the left shoulder being higher uh, than the, the volume on the right shoulder. That's just a, a typical thing. You, it's good to see volume increase in some way, shape, or form during the, the formation of the head as well. And so we measured that minimum downside target. We did get the breakdown, but it never really went and got to that target. So we got the breakdown, but we didn't see the target reached. It, it's a typical problem. It's something you're going to see a lot. And then the reverse head and shoulders, simply the same thing with the left shoulder head, right, right shoulder. And again, you want the left shoulder to typically have more volume. But in this case, it's eh, not that much in comparison to the right shoulder. So it doesn't have to be that way, but it's one way you can, can look to confirm a pattern. Uh, and in this case, of course, it did execute. But again, we didn't get anywhere close to the uh, minimum upside target. So it's good to show you these patterns and how they don't always execute the way you expect. So and with that, Tom, I know you must have gotten some questions and uh, I'll try and be uh, quick about my answers. Yeah, the uh, first of all, great presentation. Uh, I know there were some right at, just in the last minute or two that were uh, saying that they lost your video, but I never lost it. So I think it was kind of a, a hit or miss kind of a thing, but it was just right at, literally right at the very end. But there were a couple of questions that came in, so uh, I'll feed you those. Okay. I don't know that we'll, we'll be able to get to all of them, but I do have a few of them here listed. Uh, first question is, can you apply these chart patterns to intraday charts? It seemed like most years were daily. Yes, you can. Uh, the patterns I find, when I find them on those intraday charts or the shorter uh, charts, they don't always execute as expected. Uh, I don't know uh, exactly if that's just the volatility that's going on when you're in a shorter time frame like that. But yes, you can use patterns that way. Now, Bulkowski, uh, when he talks about, like I said, those symmetrical triangles, uh, he he really does stick to that three week uh, or more time frame. So in that case, you know, any symmetrical triangle on your intraday chart would really be a pennant. And so you'd look for, you could uh, look for it to break on either way, but it's, it's called a pennant because it's in the shorter time frame. All right. Second question. And I think uh, this one was actually answered as you went through your presentation, but the first, the question that came in was, um, do you find the W bottoming pattern to be a bullish pattern? I think that question came in yes. when you were looking at DVN, which was a symmetrical triangle. Yes. And then later you talked about the triple bottom and I think you answered the question. Yeah. It, it's a reversal pattern. Uh, that's really the, the main thing. If, even if you just realize, uh, you know, which ones are reversals, which ones are continuations, uh, that helps immensely. But yeah, a double bottom pattern is a reversal pattern, so it must come down into it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, question, I don't know if you have an answer for this one, but uh, there was a question that came in. What are the success percentage levels on the various chart patterns? I know you spoke earlier that Volkowski uh, talked a little bit about that in his second book, but any ideas or any thoughts? Well, I can tell you that that uh, the percentages typically don't go too much far past the uh, sixty-five percent range. Uh, it's better than half the time they execute as expected, but it's not a hundred percent. It's far from a hundred percent. So that's why it's good to get the confirmation from maybe other indicators, from the volume patterns, uh, to help confirm the pattern because they don't necessarily, there's a lot of times where they don't act, act as expected, or you'll get the execution like I was showing, but you won't get those target levels met. Okay. Um, that kind of, uh, you know, makes uh, a lot of sense there. Um, last question. And I think this is a really interesting one. Um, what if the pattern contradicts the prevailing trend. And I'm just going to throw this out there. So we're in a bull market and you see a head and shoulder topping pattern. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Uh, well, it's a reversal pattern. If I'm coming up into that head and shoulders pattern, 
I'm going to look for the left shoulder having more volume and I'll look for the head to have a bit more volume. And I'm going to look for volume to start declining on that uh, right shoulder. Let me get you a, get you one up here. I mean, we can have very long rallies and yeah, I mean, in a bull market, we, we do sort of look for bullish patterns to execute, not, not necessarily bearish patterns, but, you know, you get I, this one, for example, you get the trend up into it and you, you've got the volume confirmation on it, um, mostly. And you've had that really uh, long established trend. The one thing that um, a lot of people do, and I don't know if it's uh, if you want to call it a mistake or what, but like I said, with head and shoulders patterns, they're reversals. So you really don't start looking for a head and shoulders, a bearish head and shoulders when you're coming down into the pattern. It, it's just that's not a head and shoulders if it's coming down into the pattern. It's, these are not typically, well, they're not continuation patterns. They're reversal patterns. So you have to reverse the uh, prevailing trend going into it. And I would think, too, I mean, if you've got a bearish pattern, um, and you're in a bull market. I mean, my thought process is that, you know, there's less chance that it's go going to execute. But if it does mm -hmm. execute, you still want to be aware of what potentially could be a downside target. Right. And as you can see here, it was in a very strong uptrend, but it needed a pullback. Uh, so it formed this head and shoulders. We got that breakdown, but because it was in a very strong bullish uh, trend, you know, it didn't actually reach that minimum downside target before reversing, but we did get the breakdown. So, you know, setting a stop at the neckline would have uh, preserved some of your profit. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that was a great job. Um, I'm sure everybody will be excited to go back and review the segment later or perhaps follow in uh, the Market Watchers live blog. Um, you said you're going to be posting these. Uh, these yes. very charts in there later today, correct? Yeah, all of these right here are going to go into the Market Watchers Live chart list, and I will post them into the recap. So we're going to have just a bunch of these uh, in there. What I may do is rather than the picture of it, I'll just have the link. Um, and then I will uh, probably put some of these guidelines in uh, that come right out of, again, uh, Thomas Bulkowski's book. So... Highly recommend. I mean, if you want more information, it's it, this one especially is really great for beginners. I mean, he uh, the the actual um, it's in color to some degree here. You get some really um, pretty uh, graphics to help explain them. Uh, and he goes through exactly how they they start. And uh, he will talk a bit about how um, they typically execute. He doesn't really go into the uh, testing of these patterns in this particular book. It's really a book just for you to learn what the patterns are and why they form. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you very much. And, um, you know, again, if you're interested and would, if you came in late, and you didn't get to see the whole presentation, then uh, you, do, you can definitely go back and look at the video. That'll be on our site until Monday. Uh, or um, you can just uh, review later when... Uh, uh, Aaron updates the Market Watchers live blog. You can go through and uh, check some of those charts out and get a little refresher. And what I think I'm going to do, um, I, I think I'll do a chart pattern of the week in the Decision Point blog. So I'll go into more detail about each of the chart patterns. And well, you saw my list of uh, chart patterns here. I think that'll keep us busy for quite a few weeks in the Decision Point blog. <laughs> for sure. All right. Uh, if you're ready, we'll go ahead and swing into the 10 and 10. Absolutely. My voice is certainly ready for a break. We did say we would start with uh, Gush, G-U-S-H. Yep. I already cheated. So let me go ahead and pull this up. Right I'd away. imagine you had some time. So. <laughs> yeah, um, but I was listening and following along and kind of watching the chat box too. But here, uh, here's Gush. One thing I'll say, and I, I marked everything based on, you know, as if it was an individual stock or an ETF a regular ETF. Now keep in mind, this is a juiced ETF or a leveraged ETF. So this is actually tracking the oil and gas index. Um, and it's three times, it's a bullish three times. So if that index goes up 1% in theory, this should go up 3%. The only thing I would, I always suggest is that when you're trading these leveraged ETFs, that you really watch the underlying technicals on the index, index that they're designed to track. 
because the leveraged ETFs themselves do lose a little bit of ground. Um, trying to think of the word. I can't come up with it right now, but um, I'll come up with it maybe a little bit later. But it does lose some of it. It's kind of like options, the way they lose value over time. Uh, you have a little bit of that with these uh, leveraged ETFs as well. But just looking at the chart itself, I mean, you definitely are in a, in a downtrend. It almost looks like a little bit of a bottoming head and shoulder type of a pattern uh, where we broke out. We've come back down. I think the two key areas, we went a little bit below price support, but so far we are holding this trend line. So this is the area I'd look for this to reverse. All right. Uh, the next one we have is uh, KTOS, Kratos. Uh, actually, I could see a head and shoulders on this and uh, a reverse flag possibly setting up right now. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the upsloping neckline, but I can I definitely can see what you're looking at here. I always use yeah, that. Rather messy, but like I said, they uh, those tops, the shoulders and heads can be a bit messy. And and Volkowski does uh, mention that. Yeah, the only problem, and again, the reason, uh, just to kind of go into a little bit further detail, the only reason I don't like the break here as a major breakdown is simply because you haven't taken out either of these prior lows when you take it out. So you still got price support levels that haven't been violated. So sometimes I've seen these where they where you get a breakdown, but you hold on to support and you just simply move back higher again. So I would just be cautious and maybe sit back and take a look at some of these. Now, this one in particular did execute, and you can see on the move to the downside, the volume really picked up. Um, I would say at this point that the stock is clearly in a downtrend. Uh, if you can't see it visually from the price action, the MACD is certainly telling you that. But uh, to the downside, I would now be looking. There was a major breakout, um, and I would expect uh, that this continues. I don't see any reason to buy, in other words, until I would see maybe this price support down here closer to $9 being tested. Some sort of a reversing candle at that level. Uh, might give me a little bit more hope in the near term for a uh, long trade. All right. Next one is a favorite of mine, Tiffany, T-I-F. Uh, I think they mentioned something about a doji, but I can't remember if it was on a weekly or daily chart. Okay. Um, Tiff. Um, well, I, I'm just seeing sideways consolidation. I mean, you, I think it's very clear, at least to me, where your major resistance level is. Uh, we have gone up and tried to get through this $96 area multiple occasions and continuing to go sideways for the most part right in this area. We did have this one little dip. But for the most part, if you look back over the last seven or eight months, we have been in a range from about 87 to 96. So I think we're getting closer to the top of it. I like the volume picking up recently. I like the MACD coming off the center line, turning up, but I don't like buying it right before it hits a major resistance level where we've seen failures throughout 2017. So I think the chart is starting to look better, um, but I would be uh, very bullish on a breakout above 96 on a close, and especially with the volume accelerating up to, say, 2 million or more. All right. Let's see. The next one, uh, DVN. Oh, this is going to steal some of my thunder. I actually bought DVN yesterday, so I was going to ah. be able to a trade that I just started. Um, but yeah, I like, I like it. It's, uh, they reported better than expected, uh, earnings and, uh, and top line revenues and the stock. I actually wish I'd caught it the day before because it came down beautifully right to price support. Um, but here is a stock that definitely is showing signs of reversing that downtrend. Um, you also can see a couple of things here. Number one, pretty big support area back in May at about $37. You can see the top was just above thirty-seven dollars, and I'm gonna I'm gonna draw another line here at the top of this gap because this was the earnings-related gap where we saw the huge move up, and so we came down actually two days ago would have been a better entry. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't see it that day, but we had we went down into this gap support zone and then printed a hammer right at the top of gap support, and now the stock is coming back up. I like the stock. I think uh, I'm looking for it to go back up and test the recent high just above forty-one. All righty. Let's see. And the next one I have is uh, PayPal, P-Y-P-L. Great stock. Um, let's. Uh, nice uptrend, that's for sure. Yeah. This one, uh, PayPal has been great. Um, Square has been great. Uh, got. I am a little concerned about today's candlestick um, with a negative divergence. So that would be my only, and it's a short-term concern. It's not a long-term concern. 
But anytime I get a negative divergence with a and a combination that along with a reversing candle, that is telling me maybe from a short term perspective to think about uh, taking my profit. So there is the divergence. So you got higher prices. MACD is lower. And normally I don't like to get in on a negative divergence or sell too soon because a lot of times you get this uh, continuing move to the upside and then you eventually just take out that prior high on the MACD. So the negative divergence is eliminated. So I think sometimes you can act too quickly. And even today, even though the candle has a reverse, there's a reversing candle there, we're not done yet today. We still have another three hours to go. So we could certainly strengthen into the close and that dark cloud cover that's formed so far would be gone. But if that holds into the close with a negative divergence, for me, if I had nice profits as a short-term trader, I would take them and wait because a lot of times you get a reversing candle, negative divergence, and you can see a 50-day, potentially a 50-day test somewhere down the road. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to you know, sell right off to 68 or $69, but what could happen is we see sideways consolidation allowing that 50-day to come up from underneath. It's been a great performer. I love the stock. I just don't like short-term technicals, technicals here with that uh, potential reversing candle today. All right. Next one we have, and I, I know Carl wrote about this one months ago, but uh, uranium, U-R-A. All right, uh, U-R-A. Um, yeah, I like the action. I mean, I, I, this is probably one of those ETFs that's extremely volatile. I mean, we were up at $19 back in February, dropped all the way to 12 recently. But I do like the volume that's come in on this push to the upside. And I also like the bullish behavior, holding that 20-day moving average and then bouncing off of it. So that much I like. The problem is now that it's gone up here the last couple of days, I think it's really, um, it's kind of skewed the reward to risk uh, for entry at the current level. So what I would be looking for to try to manage my risk is either entry on a 20-day test, similar to what we just saw, or waiting to see if we can get a pretty significant breakout, uh, which would be above about 1475. The problem is your support's at 13, your resistance is 1475, and you're trading almost at 14 right in the middle. So to me, I have about a one-to-one -one reward to risk, and that doesn't set the uh, trade up in my favor. So I would do nothing here, but I do like the fact that we we're seeing more volume come in. I like the MACD turning higher. I just would need a better entry point. That's all. All right. Uh, let's go to CVS. All right. CVS. I think this is our seventh. Um, well, we've got a price resistance area and then a trend line resistance area that we're going to have to negotiate here. So, you know, I'm trying to find stocks that are um, strong momentum plays to the upside that I can trade long. This would not be one of them. Uh, I don't like the way it's been trading on heavy volume to the downside, um, especially I don't like it on a bounce as it fails at the 20 day moving average. But a couple things to look at here. Number one, you've got your trend line that clearly has been a struggle each time. The last several times we've tried to get through this trend line, we have not been able to do so. And then we've also got a big breakdown recently on heavy volume below the support that was established in mid-October. Huge move down, very heavy volume. And look at that long tail, that failure, and then back down for the next couple of days. Right now, I don't see enough to even consider going long on the stock because we're getting close to another major test of resistance. Um, so for me, I'd pass. All right. Next one, HTHT. Uh, -T. H T H T. Mm-hmm. All right. New one. Yeah, I don't even know this one. <laughs> we stumped you. Yeah, there aren't too many of them out there. Okay, China Lodging Group. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, there seems to be a lot going on here with the volume. Um, so that bothers me a little bit. And the fact that it is struggling to hold on to its 50-day moving average today also is a little bit of a concern. I think probably what I would be watching for here, if I, if I was looking to go long, and this might fit in a little bit to what uh, you were talking about in your chart patterns earlier, Aaron, but maybe um, you know what you could be looking at here is something like you know that maybe you got like a little bit of a bullish wedge, mm -hmm. so you have a nice uptrend in play, a wedge, uh, but you want to see these break to the upside. 
Um, otherwise, you can get really frustrated as this triangle squeezes, this piece of pie squeezes in this wedge. Um, you know, it was very overbought. You can see that the RSI, many occasions over the past few months, we've been up to 70. The good news is we're down to 40s now. Uh, the question is, if you get in here, where do you want to set your stop? Because you've got to keep a stop in play. For me, it would probably be down below this recent low, which means you've got to give it about three or four bucks to the downside. And my target would be up uh, closer to 140, 142. So the reward to risk isn't bad here. Uh, but you just don't know how long this wedge is going to take place. So maybe if it gets down closer to 120, your reward to risk would be even better. And maybe that's worth taking a chance. But if it breaks down below this trend line and does so on a high volume again, I'd be real careful. All right. Perfect. Uh, number nine, UNG, natural gas. Oh, I always get this one wrong. So whatever I say here, just completely reverse it and you should be good to do <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, natural gas remains in a downtrend. I see no reason to go long. I mean, yes, we have seen a, a pop recently and maybe it's a little bit of a flag short term, but the problem is for me is that the long term remains, I think, firmly implanted in a downtrend. And if you connect those three highs, I'd have to at least see that trend line broken to the upside. So maybe if we take out the recent high up at about 660, maybe 665, we see a break above that. That would be an indication at least that that short-term trend line has been broken. But I think if you look across, I mean, there's just been so many disappointments. Um, you know, you could draw a trend line here coming across and look, we broke that. Um, you could even move it down here, maybe a little lower and you can see how we, we break um, short-term resistance levels, but then we get no follow through. Uh, and then we just go right back down. So when I see something that isn't working for me technically, I don't trade it. Uh, if it, if, if uh, you know, if it fools me once, it's one thing, but if it keeps fooling me, I normally just stop trading it. And I used to trade the UNG and didn't have a whole lot of success for some of the reasons I just pointed out. And so for me, I don't like to trade it, but if you have success, I think it's great. Mm -hmm. And here I would just watch this trend line. Yeah. USO and, and UNG are two of my uh, banes of existence. I, I just, I, I really struggle with those when I trade them. So I just don't trade them anymore. I think, uh, Greg, I think Greg Schnell has some pretty good success with uh, the natural gas. So maybe if you're following some of the stuff that he does, maybe that'll help. Absolutely. All right. Last one is uh, Amgen, A-M-G-N. Yeah, we just talked about the biotechs yesterday and the fact that, you know, perhaps we're still okay because we haven't taken out recent lows and I think Amgen is kind of the poster child of that argument. Um, you know, we've got these, uh, the recent low that was established back in mid-August. We broke out above this double top right here, which I thought was very bullish. We came down, initially held on to that price support and bounced right off of it. Then we came back down and broke it. And you can see volume picked up a little bit. But the overall trend of higher highs and higher lows remains intact. I would not want to lose about 165 or so, maybe 165 and a half on Amgen on a closing basis. But I think the reward to risk here is actually set up pretty nicely um, with the stock down closer to that 165 level and quite a bit away from the 190 area, which we reached about two and a half months ago. So I like Amgen. I could understand the bearish argument, but I think as long as it holds onto this price support, I would remain on the bullish side. All right. And that is 10. There we go. All right. I don't know if... Uh, Want to give a quick market update? and uh, then Let's uh, just at least look at the candle glance. So let's do our final market update. Actually, we're right here on the uh, market summary page. So I'm just going to start here. All right. As you can see, uh, uh, Canada, we're looking at a really positive movement here in comparison to uh, the NYSE, S&P 500, Dow which are both down. Major indexes, we are also seeing the small caps and mid caps really take off here and lead uh, and are leaders right now uh, today as far as trading. As you can see, uh, Dow Transports, utilities are the laggards today with transports down almost 1%. Sector spiders, consumer discretionary is now on the top. Uh, last time we looked, energy was, so they're both uh, trading places there. Uh, with uh, being up about a half a percent each. And there you go. We just switched places once again.
Utilities and consumer staples are the laggards currently. Let's go ahead. I want to, I do want to look at our candle glance, show you how to get there very quickly. And then I'm going to show you some excellent, um, I just passed it. There it is. Okay, here we are. Uh, so as you can see, we we had that uh, gap down or the really that deep uh, decline in the morning. And at this point, the major indexes are negative, uh, but they are consolidating. They're moving sideways right now. NASDAQ has just gotten itself into the positive territory. And there you go, Russell 2000. Like I said, small caps looking pretty good right now. Uh, Treasury yields down somewhat. Uh, UUP is continuing down and making new intraday lows as we speak. Commodities are doing quite well with a nice rally. USO gapped up, and now we're looking at a possible flag formation here. And uh, we'll have to see if that uh, manages to execute with a breakout before the end of the day. Gold having a great day, gapped up, and GLD has been traveling higher and higher uh, since then and is now at uh, an intraday high around 123. Uh, volatility index is lower today, but it is still reading at about 11, um, 11.5, which is showing some nervousness. Uh, if you recall, we've been below 10 for quite a, quite a while, now starting to get up into those uh, 11s and 12s. Declines are leading advances. And that concludes our final market update. And with that, I think I'm going to just go right into the sentiment charts, if that's... Uh, okay with you, Tom, and you can get ready for your anatomy of a trade. It works for me. And also I uh, want to mention uh, you've got a special guest joining you next Wednesday as we speak of sentiment. Uh, mm -hmm. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about your guest? Yes. Very excited. Mark Young from Wall Street Sentiment Survey. Uh, he's uh, wallstreetsentiment.com. Uh, uh, and that's an excellent place to get your regular uh, sentiment. He has reports that he sends out uh, weekly, and I think he even has uh, options for monthly. Uh, this is where we get the the numbers from. You know, we when Tom and I take that survey, which we're going to do shortly, to tell you what's going to happen next week or what we think will happen next week. Uh, Mark Young is the one who puts together that survey uh, that he sends out to all of the market timers and. So he will come and he's going to talk about survey. He even calls himself a sentimentologist. So we'll really be talking a lot of sentiment. He's going to really get into the um, nuts and bolts of why we look at it and why it's important. So you'll definitely want to be here next Wednesday if you're not traveling to get to your Thanksgiving destinations. Uh, but you can watch the review after your turkey dinner. So let's uh, look very quickly at some of these sentiment numbers. Uh, I think it's really interesting. We're finally starting to see some some really nice bearish readings. Uh, for example, as far as the put call ratio is concerned, and this is uh, against the OEX right here. What we look for are these peaks. And once we get the peaks and they start coming down, uh, that ratio comes down, that's when you're looking for the rallies. And right now you can see we're still moving higher. We haven't quite peaked, but we're getting in that area where we normally do peak. And if, when we get the peak, that's when we're going to start looking for a uh, rally move. So we want to see the put call ratio get higher at this point. But we're starting to finally see some uh, uh, bearishness here on the put call ratio. The next one is the AAII sentiment. This is a poll that uh, is taken online by individual investors. And right now, remember what I've been telling you is we want to see some bearish numbers. We want to see some bearish activity here. And, you know, last week I wasn't here, unfortunately, to discuss it with you, but we were seeing some very high bearish readings here on the uh, bull bear ratio. Uh, when you start looking at twice as many um, bears as bulls, then, you know, things are getting very uh, bearish there. So we saw that step back today, but I think the fact that we're still getting these uh, pretty lar large bearish readings, you know, where we've peaked uh, previously. Uh, so we want to see things get really bearish because that means we're going to get that return. So with this topping action that we've seen recently, uh, that has made people uh, a little bit nervous. And so now they're when they're surveyed, they're starting to feel more bearish. And 
once we get everybody very bearish, that's when we should look for that rally. Now, I found really interesting the, the name exposure index. This is the National Association of Active Investment Managers. And they let us know what their exposure is to the market. And notice, uh, it's we're seeing a backing off. The, the active money managers are getting less and less, less exposed. And we're now looking at an exposure index of less than uh, 50. So they're getting very bearish. That means we need to start looking for uh, some rally. And, you know, typically, you know, you want to follow where the money managers, what they're doing. And I think that's uh, an interesting thing to follow with this chart. But what I'm really looking for is when we get these uh, climactic type readings or especially low or especially high readings. And you can see we're now at a level that we haven't seen since 2016 as far as uh, name exposure right now. So they're getting very bearish and I think that's gonna be really good for the market um, in the intermediate term. The next one I'm gonna look at is our Rydex asset analysis. And here we go. Uh, we track a group of funds, uh, Guggenheim uh, now manages these Rydex funds and we track the bear funds assets and we track the money market assets and we track the bull and sector fund assets. So we can watch what's happening with the actual money. This isn't somebody saying, yeah, I feel bearish next week, or, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bear coming up for the, this is where the money's actually going. This I think is uh, extraordinarily helpful in finding out what's actually going on in the market. And what I'm noticing with these, of course, the thumbnail is, is a lot more useful um, just because the way the data comes in daily. So what we're looking at in the thumbnail right now, and I put the arrow so you can see what I'm considering is going on. So bear index, we're starting to see a lot of uh, push into the bear funds, and that means people are getting more bearish. Money markets, though, are not really following through here. They're starting to move down. So people are pulling cash out to either be bearish or to be bullish, because you can see the assets in the bull funds are starting to rise as well. Uh, I think if we start seeing a really good run on the bear funds, a lot more people uh, buying into those inverse funds, uh, that's when we're gonna get to that really bearish uh, place. I think we're getting there because at this point you can see the assets are rising in the bull funds but not as high as previously. So we're starting to see a bit of rotation into those bear funds. And so again, we wanna see this. We wanna see people get really bearish when people are very bearish. That's when you get those reversals uh, to the upside. And that's uh, all I really wanna show as far as sentiment. And I think that leaves you some time, Tom, to talk about a few anatomy of a trade or trades. Yeah, I've got a few here that I'll go over quickly. Um, first, let's pull up, because um, I mentioned it earlier, one, actually this is the newest trade, is Devon Energy. Um, and really what I'm looking for here is for the stock to continue holding the top of gap support, maybe as a secondary level, you could look at the recent high. So there's like this little zone in here between maybe 37 and a quarter and 37.75, where I'd like to see this stock hold. What I'm looking for is a return back up to where we were earlier. And what I like specifically is the high volume. You can see the volume has been extremely heavy on the way up. Uh, the stocks run from $34 to 41 on that kind of volume. That suggests to me there's accumulation. So I like these pullbacks to price support, gap support, rising 20 day moving average. I think this whole area. Now, again, as I mentioned, I didn't get in the perfect timing. I think that would have been the close on uh, Wednesday when it re reversed and closed back up uh, above this gap support area. But uh, I did get in fairly early um, yesterday. And so far the stock's doing pretty well, but what I'm looking for again is a move back up just a little over 41. So this was the latest, um, but I got a, a couple of different ones to show you. I'll show you some that are working, some that aren't. Um, actually PII, I did take profits on. Um, this was Polaris. And the reason again was this gap support top of gap support and the rising 20 day moving average. We pulled right back You can say, see post earnings, huge gap up, massive volume and buying throughout the day after the gap up. Keep in mind when everybody wants to buy market makers are on the other side of the trade. That's why we tend to see a lot of gap fills. 
um, maybe not that same day, but after that, after the gap up, maybe a couple of days later, a couple of weeks later, we'll see prices rotate, you know, or start to move lower. That was not the case here. We kept moving up. So I just put it into my strong earnings chart list and waited. And I got it down here right at the 20 day moving average. And this one had gone back up a couple of days ago to about 122 and change. You can see the tail from back earlier in November. And as it's been hesitating here the last couple of days, I think I actually sold this one on Wednesday um, at 120 and change. So it's about where I sold it. But I was getting pretty close to the area where I was looking for at 123. And I didn't hold it that long. And the, the beauty of taking profits is that you free up cash. So mm. that you have cash available for other trades. Because part of the problem is if, this, if the stock pulls back and then you're looking to get into another trade that looks good, you don't really want to sell this one because it, you know, you've given back most of your profits. It just starts creating more problems. So anytime I have a nice gain like that, short period of time, I don't hesitate to take some profits, especially if it starts to stall like it seems to be doing right now. Hey, Tom, uh, before you leave that chart, I, I, there's a great little example there. A lot of people might say that looks like a descending triangle uh, right before that breakout. But remember, guys, uh, too much white space. So it didn't execute to the downside like it would be expected to. So, yeah, the descending triangle up there right after the gap. Up here? Yeah. So you have that declining tops trend line and what looks like could be a horizontal underneath to form that uh, descending triangle. But it didn't execute. And one of the reasons, I think, is way too much white space underneath that declining trend channel. Um, let me see. There was another one, LII. This was Lennox. Uh, this one did really well. And actually, I made, well, no, that's about where I got out yesterday, 195 or so. I actually was watching it um, early in the day and I just set, I just randomly set a stop or a uh, sell point at one, I think it was 195.50. And uh, didn't, uh, sometimes the problem is if I set it right to the level that I want to get it and I'm not watching it and maybe some of you have seen this before, you set a, a level at 197, you see this high of the day is 196.98, and they won't give you those last two pennies uh, before things, the thing comes back down. So sometimes I'll just set it, you know, a little bit below my uh, expected level that I'm looking for it to hit. So anyway, I got out of that one, did pretty well with that one, uh, but trust me, they're not all winners. Um, <laughs> IMAX is one that I'm in right now. This one also came down to 20-day moving average support after a really solid move here on earnings breaking out above that prior high. Came down, hit the 20-day, and it's moved back up. I actually sold this one yesterday lower than where it is. Um, but this is the area of resistance right here near 25 um, that I was looking for. Now, my guess is it's going to continue to go higher. So, you know, some might be saying, why would you get out of that? Well, I get out of it because I can make uh, probably 8% or, I don't know, maybe it was 7% in three or four trading days and just move to the sideline and wait for another opportunity where I don't have as much risk. See, to me, when I get up to this level, I, ha I have a lot more risk now because I'm at resistance. And if it pulls back even to the 20 day moving average, which is at 23.58, I'm down at buck 19. That's what, 5%? Um, I really don't want to hang on while it pulls back, you know, to another key support area. So mm -hmm. I tend to be pretty quick. If they work out quickly, I try to take the money and move on. Um, one that did not work out, I actually got stopped out of this one today, was PACAR, P C A R. Uh, this stock is getting absolutely creamed. Look at the volume picking up. Now, my my thought process here, this is this actually, they beat earnings estimates. They beat revenue, top line and bottom line estimates. And they did sell off afterwards. But my thinking is, well, a lot of it was built in. So I don't really worry too much when they pull back. I mean, that was pretty hefty pullback. Maybe I should have worried a little more than I did. Um, but it had price support at about 69 to 69 and a half. You can see these various tops coming in. So I actually bought it when it came back down close to 69 near this tail. And my original thought process was I was going to get out if it lost that support level. But if you notice, when it broke down here, the volume was relatively light to what we had seen before. So I was just watching. Then I got a big move up yesterday. I was like, okay, good. Um, you know, I held on. It's going to pay off. And so I actually had a stop below uh, the low that was established on Wednesday. And you can see with the swift move down today, I don't know where it's going to close, but I'm not taking a chance on holding it. So I actually got stopped out with a small loss on PCAR earlier today. A uh, couple more real quick. General Motors was one that uh, I am in right now. I'm actually, I think I have a, 
uh, sell on it at 44 and a half or 44, 45. And what I was looking at there was the gap resistance right here which was at 44.64. And I remember I just set it a little bit lower. I'm pretty sure it was 44.44 or 44.45 or 44.50. Um, but off of a 41 and change entry, it was down or maybe, I think it was like 41.80 or maybe it was 42. I don't remember. It might've been a gap, top of gap support. But anyway, you can see that comes down into this. And this is a very significant candle here. Look at the volume this day where it gapped up to 41, closed just over 42. When it was coming down, I was talking about this 41, 42 area. I thought it was really key support. And uh, General Motors was able to bounce back off of that and doing pretty well. Um, and I have no problems getting out at 44 and a half if it gets there. And then the last one that I had, uh, this one is not working out, Johnson & Johnson. Um, I haven't sold it yet, but I don't like this action. I really expected this bounce off the 20-day. Uh, one of the reasons I'm hanging on, which is not a good reason, is just that Johnson & Johnson is not very volatile. So, you know, I'm not worried about it being down 10% when I look at it two hours later. But it's still, uh, it is breaking down beneath what I where I wanted it to hold. So this one may be gone by the end of the day. And I did actually have one other one. I'm in this one. This one's doing well, but it's this one has scared the heck out of me a couple of times. Um, here, I, and I talked about this one on the show, looking for a reversal this particular day when it had gone below the 20. It did reverse. It printed that hammer. And at the time, it was on a little bit increasing volume, which I like to see. And it went up and was doing really well. And then outside of earnings, my biggest nemesis is a secondary offering. If I could get rid of secondary offerings, I'd be <laughs> really happy. Um, but they, they came out, talked about a secondary offering. I didn't talk about it. They announced it. And the stock immediately went down because there's dilution. And when they do these secondary offerings, they always do the offering beneath the current price. And so you can count on going down. And I thought I was going to get stopped out because I had a stop beneath that hammer, the low. And then it came right back up. Is doing well. Very good volume with that offering here the last couple of days. And this one I have a target. And I don't remember where my, it's 30 and something. So I'm getting close. Um, it'll probably, I'm sure it's just beneath that, that high. So those were some different anatomies of a trade. Some of them worked, some of them didn't. Mm -hmm. Some of them in, some of them out. Um, but the whole idea is to manage risk with these trades. So that's the one thing. When you get in, you got to know why you're getting in. And if they start to break down, I mean, to be honest, I'm even violating my rules a little bit by hanging in with Johnson & Johnson right now. Mm -hmm. But um, Discipline. Yeah, yeah discipline. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're following a mechanical system or you're following your own system with price support or whatever you just got to stick to it and if it's not working then you need to change something yeah uh, you know somebody had asked early in the program you know how many trades on average we make you know a day a month a week uh i can tell you right now that you wake you make far more trades than i do i'm i'm i've always been more of the uh intermediate term investor you know the shortest term holdings typically would only be about, you know, would be two to three weeks would be a short, uh, short term holding for me. So I'm learning a lot on this show, though. So I have to admit, I've gotten a little bit more active uh, with short term trades uh, in my cash account. So but typically, you know, if you're looking at my history, um, I don't trade a whole lot of stocks. I, you know, I just don't. And if I do, they are longer term investments typically but like i said i'm starting to make more so yeah i uh i trade a lot more frequently but that's a story and a topic for another day um we are coming into the end of another show another week uh, i know we didn't get into our picks i'm going to say that the market goes higher next week though uh me too i'm a bull next week as well all right so we'll talk about that more next week as we get into it uh, i do want to thank everybody for stopping by uh keep in mind next wednesday aaron's good friend mark young uh, will be joining us from wallstreetsentiment.com. So a great day for sentiment uh, next Wednesday. And then next Thursday and Friday, there will be no Stock Market Watchers Live show. So no Market Watchers Live. Um, we'll be back, though, the following Monday. Thank you all for joining us today. Complete the survey, please, if you uh, could, as you exit the show, lower right-hand part of your screen under how do we do. As a reminder, Market Watchers Live airs on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Friday and a great weekend. Happy trading.